Last time I was talking about how if a, if a researcher is collecting data from a sample of 50 working students and a sample of 50 non-working students, the researcher is going to end up with one of the possible combinations of 100 students that might be selected for the study. And if you wanted to find out how many possible combinations of 100 uh, would be available, you'd actually have to find the number of possible combinations of 50 working students and also find the number of 50 possible combinations of non-working students and then multiply those two numbers. Um, I can show you a quick example of what I mean. When, um, when, when you're taking, when you have two populations of three people, you have, and you're taking a sample of two people from each population, you have three possible combinations of two from population one and three possible combinations of two from population two, which means that to find the number of combinations of four, or to find the number of possible combinations of four, you have to take the number of possible combinations from population one and multiply it by the number of possible combinations from population two, which would be three over here times three over here, which gives you nine. And 9 actually ends up being the number of possible combinations of 4 that might be selected um, in your data set. So if we wanted to find out the number of possible combinations of 100 that we could select, we would have to multiply the number of combinations of 50 working students by the number of possible combinations of 50 non-working students. And we can also predict the shape of this graph. Um, well, first I talked about what, first let's talk about what's on the number line. Um, on the number line, you have the sample mean difference, which is whatever you get by subtracting the mean of one of your samples by the mean of the other sample. Um, or when you subtract the mean of sample 1 by the mean of sample 2. Um, our example would have a sample mean difference of actually um, 1.5 because 5.5 minus 4 is 1.5. That would be our sample mean difference. So all of these right here would have a sample mean difference of 0. Um, meaning that the mean of the first sample is the same as the mean of the second sample, and you get zero when you subtract them. So how can we find out what the shape of this curve would be? Um, well, we know one of the assumptions for the independent samples t-test is either both populations are normal, or both sample sizes are at least 30. If you satisfy at least one of these, your um, your curve or your distribution of combinations will be normal. Let's see if we satisfied one of these. Um, we don't know if both populations are normal because we're, we haven't looked at the entire populations, but we do know we've collected data from at least 30 in both samples. We know that both of both of our samples have a sample size of at least 30 which means we've satisfied this condition, which means these combinations of 100 will have a normal shape. Um, I'll draw a few more boxes. Um, let's see. And so we know that our shape is normal because of, um, we know the shape of the possible combinations that we, we might be selecting has a normal shape because we've um, selected two samples that are at least 30. And we're also 
going to be looking at the situation when the null is true because when we start out at the beginning, at the beginning of the study, we're assuming we're assuming that the null is true, and we actually look at how extreme of an outcome we have in that situation. So if you're assuming that the null is true, it means you're assuming the center of the curve is the null value, which is the number inside of the null hypothesis. Um, whenever the null hypothesis is actually true, the null value is at the center of the of your curve of possible combinations. Um, especially when your curve is normal like it is right here, then the null value is at the center. Um, so let's see what our null value is. Our null hypothesis says that population mean 1 equals population mean 2. Another way to write that out would be the null hypothesis says that Um, population mean 1 minus population mean 2 equals 0. Because this is really saying the same thing as saying that the population means are equal. So when we're testing whether the population means are equal, we're testing whether the difference between the two population means comes out to 0. So this is our null value inside of the null hypothesis. So and since we're assuming that the null hypothesis is true, our null value of zero is at the center of the curve. It's at the highest point or the peak of the curve. Um, down here, so all of these combinations right here are combinations where sample one has the same mean as sample 2. So maybe um, maybe in this box sample 1 has a mean of maybe 3 and sample 2 also has a mean of 3. And down here in this box, right under it, this might be a combination where sample 1 has a mean of 5 and sample 2 has a mean of 5. And that combination would still be stacked above 0 because 5 minus 5 is still 0, just like how 3 minus 3 is 0. Um, down here at the, at the left end of 0, you have outcomes where um, the mean of sample 1 is actually a lower number than the mean of sample 2. So let's see what number we have right here. This is a tick mark of 1. Actually, minus 1, because it's at the left end. Which would mean that maybe this sample, sample 1, has a mean of 3. And sample 2, right here, has a mean of four in this combination, in this combination of a hundred. Three and four. Sorry. I'll try to make that more visible. Um, three and four. So if this sample one has a mean of three and sample two over here has a mean of four, then three minus four equals minus one, which is why since this combination of 100 has a, has a sample mean difference of minus 1, it's stacked above minus 1. What happens at the positive end? Um, well, over here, let's see what this is stacked above. This combination of a hundred. Um, it looks like it's stacked above. Well, one is right here. Um, so.
So um, it's hard to say exactly what it's stacked above. Um, it looks like it's a little bit below 1, because 1 is right here. So it might have a mean sample mean difference of maybe 0.5. So maybe um, this sample right here has a, a 50, might have a mean of um, 2.5. And this combination of 50 might have a mean of 3. So if that means that this entire box of 100 would have a sample mean difference of 0.5 because 3 minus 2.5 gives you the 0.5 sample mean difference. Um, so yeah, the, um, the sample mean differences down here are negative because these are the boxes or the combinations of 100 where sample 1 has the, has the lower mean. These combinations of 100 of which are stacked above 0 are where sample 1 has the higher mean and that's why the sample mean difference comes out to a positive number. Um, our sample mean difference was 5.5 minus 4, which was 1.5. So our combination of 100 would be stacked up here above 1.5. This is about 1.5 because here's 1 and here's 2. Um, it's right in between those. Also. Each combination of 100 has um, an estimated standard error. And the estimated standard error of an independent samples t-test is actually the bottom, this entire square root, because an estimated standard error is always just the bottom of the t-score. Whatever's on the bottom of the t-score is the estimated standard error. Um, What did our, um, so we know ours was 1.5. Um, I mean, our sample mean difference was 1.5. So let's look at our box right here. Sample 2 has a mean of um, 4. Sample 1 had a mean of 5. Also, the entire combination of 100 has an estimated standard error, which came out to um, 0.32, because this entire thing came out to 3.2. So our estimated standard error of this whole box, of our whole combination of 100, was 0.32. Also, the entire combination of 100 has a t-score. In our example, the t-score of this, of our box of 100 right here, came out to um, 4.69. Okay, so every possible combination of 100 has a mean of sample 1 and a mean of sample 2, which means it has a, also has a sample mean difference that you get by subtracting those numbers. Um, oh, I'm sorry, this is 5.5, not 5. So every box has a sample mean difference, every box has an estimated standard error, and every box has a t-score. Um, Just like in my example before, where I talked about the, um, the one sample t test, just because two boxes have the same sample mean difference doesn't mean that they have the same um, doesn't mean that they have the same t score, because both of these combinations of 100 right here are stacked above minus one, or about above minus one, I guess. We'll just say it's minus one, which means um, 
both of these combinations of 100 give you a difference of minus 1 when you subtract the first mean by the second mean, but they might have different estimated standard errors. This combination of 100 might have an estimated standard error of, let's say, um, let's say it has an estimated standard error of 0.2, and this box way down here is stacked up below it. What if it had an estimated standard error of 0.5. What would the T scores come out to? Well, both of these have a, have a diff, sample mean difference of minus one, which means sample mean difference is the top, what the top of the T formula equals, which would mean that both of these possible combinations would have minus 1 on the top of the formula, but the first one would have 0.2 on the bottom of the formula, because the estimated standard error goes on the bottom. The other batch of 100 people, or the other combination, would have minus 1 on the top, but it would have 0.5 on the bottom. And this t-score, what would it, it would come out to minus 5. And this t-score would come out to negative 2. So even, even though two samples, or I mean even though two combinations of 100 could have the same sample mean difference of minus 1, they might not have the same t-score, even though they're stacked on top of each other, because if the standard deviations end up being different, then the estimated standard errors will end up being different, um, and you'll have different t-scores. Because um, the estimated standard error is based on the standard deviation of sample 1 and the standard deviation of sample 2. It's based on the two sample standard deviations, and the two sample standard deviations up here might not be the same as the two sample standard deviations down here. And if they're not the same, then the two boxes will give you two different estimated standard errors, and, and then because of that, you'll have different t-scores. Um, so what happens when all of these combinations of 100 are stacked above their um, t-scores instead of above the sample mean differences. Well, just because these two combinations of 100 are stacked above the same sample mean difference, they might not be stacked above the same t-score, which means one might be pushed to a lower... When you look at the t-score graph, one might be pushed to a lower t-score, one might be raised up to a higher t-score. Just like how this one ended up, this uh, one down here, which came out to minus 2, would end up being um, further to the right. And then this t-score, this combination which gave you a t gave us a t-score of minus 2, oh wait, um, this one up here ended up having a t-score of minus 5. The top one did. The bottom one gave us the t-score of minus 2, which would mean the top one would be above a t-score further to the left, and the bottom one would be above a t-score further to the right, because in the t-score graph, this one would be stacked above minus 5, and this one would be stacked above minus 2, and they would end up being separated. And what, just the, since these uh, columns get separated, um, what happens is that the shape can be distorted, just like it was in my last example. The, state, the shape can be distorted from its bell shape that it has right here. Um, 
So let's look at this. Um, if you have a t-score number line, and you look at how the sample the combinations are spread out over the t-scores, all of the ones that are stacked above the sample mean difference of zero at the center will be stacked above zero in the t-score number on the t-score number line because whenever the sample mean difference is whenever the sample mean difference is zero it means the top of the t formula is zero which means the entire t-score is zero so all of these that have zero on the top of the formula will end up having all these combinations will be have a t-score of zero and then these ones down here with a negative sample mean difference will have a negative number on the top of the formula and they'll end up having a negative t-score down here they'll be above negative numbers all the ones where the sample mean difference came out to a positive number all of those will end up having a positive number on the top of the t-formula just like how ours up here at 1.5 had a positive number on the top because its was top number was 1.5 for our data set. Um, all of these boxes that end up giving you a positive number on the top of the t formula for the sample mean difference will end up giving you positive t scores. So those combinations that are up here at the right end will still be down at the positive end down here. And I told you how the shape can be distorted because different samples or different combinations of 100 give you different estimated standard errors, which means that um, combinations that used to be stacked above the same difference will be stacked above different t-scores a lot of the time. And the shape actually becomes a t-distribution, just like it was with the one-sample t-test. And the shape of the t distribution depends on degrees of freedom. The t distribution curve depends on degrees of freedom. In, a, in an independent samples t test, the degrees of freedom is the total number of participants, which would be 100 in our example, minus 2. Hundred minus 2. which is 98. So this would be a t-distribution curve with a, with a degrees of freedom of 98. And the shape of the t-distribution curve depends on your degrees of freedom. So if our degrees of freedom was different, then the t-distribution the curve would have a different shape. Um, if we were looking at if sample 1 had 20 people and sample 2 had 20 people, then each box would have a total of 40 people, and our degrees of freedom would be um, 38. Which would mean that the shape of the t-curve would change because when the degrees of freedom goes down from 98 down to 38, the shape of the t-curve changes along with it, along with the degrees of freedom. And when the degrees of freedom is a higher number, then the t-curve is more bell-shaped and more closer to a normal curve. When the degrees of freedom is a lower number, meaning you have smaller sample sizes, the t-curve becomes um, still symmetric, but it becomes, it becomes shorter um, with a shorter peak and flatter tails than a bell curve. And just like we had with the one-sample t-test, you'll have a critical value at some point. First I'll show you how we still have combinations of 100 that are stacked above the t-score because the entire data set of both samples has a t-score. You don't have a separate t-score for each sample. Um, so it's the entire combination of 100 that has a t-score in this case. At some point on the t-score number line, you have a critical t-score. 
critical value. We can maybe put it right there. Critical. Um, any combination of 100 that um, ends up having a t-score below the critical value, like right here, will um, force you to fail to reject. It won't allow you to reject null hypothesis. If you end up getting a combination up here, which is equal to or above the critical value, like if, if you end up getting a batch of 100 people that gives you a t-score above the critical value up here, that data set lets you reject. And all of these combinations of 100 that are equal to or above the critical value are in an area called the rejection region. This area of the curve above the critical value is called the rejection region because it contains the combinations of participants that, that will um, it, it contains the combinations of participants that allow you to reject the null hypothesis, or I mean, it includes the combinations that give you a t-score high enough to reject the null hypothesis. So a researcher wants to get a combination from this area in the rejection region. Um, so that pretty much covers this topic um, of this sampling distribution. Um, just remember, um, in an independent sample c-test, your combination has two samples. It's actually a two-sample combination because you're collecting data from two samples. And each, po and each possible combination that you might get has a mean for sample one, a mean for sample two, a different score that you get by subtracting the sample means, um, and each two-sample combination um, has an estimated standard error for the entire combination, and it has a t-score for the entire combination, which we're showing down on this t-score number line. Um, so um, that's all for this video, and I'll see you in class.